Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, what do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel saying the fathers eat the sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, declares the Lord, you surely are not going to use this proverb in Israel anymore. Behold, all souls are mine. The souls of the father, as well as the souls of the son is mine. The soul who sins will die. But if a man is righteous and practices justice and righteousness and does not eat at the mountain shrines or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel or defile his neighbor's wife or approach a woman during her menstruation period, if a man does not oppress anyone but restores to the debtor his pledge, does not commit robbery but gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with clothing, if he does not lend money on interest or take increase, if he keeps his hand from iniquity and executes true justice between man and a man, if he walks in my statutes and my ordinances as to deal faithfully, he is righteous and will surely live, declares the Lord. Then he may have a violent son who sheds blood and who does any of these things to a brother, though he himself did not do any of these things. That is, he even eats at the mountain shrines and defiles his neighbor's wife, oppresses the poor and needy, commits robbery, does not restore a pledge, but lifts up his eyes to the idols and commits abomination. He lends money on interest and takes increase. Will he live? He will not live. He has committed all these abominations. He will surely be put to death. His blood will be on his own head. Now behold, he has a son who observed all his father's sins, which he committed, and observing does not do likewise. He does not eat at the mountain shrines or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel or defile his neighbor's wife or oppress anyone or retain a pledge or commit robbery, but he gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with clothing. He keeps his hands from the poor. He does not take interest or increase, but executes my ordinances and walks in my statutes he will not die for his father's iniquity. He will surely live. As for his father, because he practiced extortion, robbed his brother, and did what was not good among the people, behold, he will die for his iniquity. Yet you say, why should the son not bear the punishment for the father's iniquities when the son has practiced justice and righteousness and has observed all my statutes and done them? He shall surely live. The person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. But if the wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed and observes all my statutes and practices justice and righteousness, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions which he has committed will not be remembered against him. Because of his righteousness, which he has practiced, he will live. Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, rather than that he should turn from his ways and live? But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity, and does according to all the abominations that a wicked man does, will he live? All his righteous deeds, which he has done, will not be remembered for his treachery, which he has committed, and his sin which he has committed, for them he will die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not right. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way not right? Is it not your ways that are not wrong? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity, and dies because of it, for his iniquity which he has committed, he will die. Again, when a wicked man turns away from his wickedness which he committed, and practices justice and righteousness, he will save his life. Because he considered and turned away from all his transgressions, which he had committed, he will surely live. He shall not die. But the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is not right. Are my ways not right, O house of Israel? Is it not your ways that are not right? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel. Each according to his conduct, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn away from all your transgressions, so that iniquity may not become a stumbling block to you. Cast away from all your transgressions, which you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. Therefore, repent and live. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Um, let's pray. 
Our God, our Lord, he who was, who is, and who is to come, you who have lived from eternity past and will live through eternity future, Lord, we thank you for a time like this and for your word that you have given unto us, your children, to learn and to uh, discern from it. Lord, it is our prayer as we discuss this evening that you will give us understanding and that you will speak to us. Help us to open and open our eyes to that which you have for us this evening. Thank you, Lord, even as you lead us through this, because we pray with thanksgiving through Christ, our Lord. All right. Um, thank you once again for the opportunity to um, uh, lead today's teaching. I hope it will be interactive. Um, the chapter, if you look at it closely, is self explanatory so we probably will not be looking at it verse by verse but i will um probably just discuss uh, and give a general background and then after that we will delve into questions and discussions and i hope that we'll all uh partake and and you know feel free to discuss and share our thoughts on some of the questions that i have down so um, last week, we discussed Ezekiel chapter 33, and we saw the need to warn or alert others and to be watchmen. Today, we're looking at another chapter in the same book, Ezekiel 18, which has some similarities with what we read in the last Bible study. Whereas chapter 18 discusses the call for personal righteousness and the need to own up to our own responsibilities and avoid the blame game as believers. Chapter 33 talked about or reviewed chapter 18 and introduced another idea not found in chapter 18. And that is God reviewed Ezekiel's responsibility as a watchman, which was first established in chapter three of Ezekiel of the same book. A Bible scholar once said, there are few issues more important to the formation of disciples than the issue of taking responsibility for our own lives. For each one should carry his own load. Galatians 6, 5 says, there is no progress in Christian discipline until we are willing to carry our load until we are willing to take responsibility for our lives, we will not show much progress. It is all too easy to blame. The tendency to blame others rather than taking responsibility for our own lives is, a, is as old as Garden of Eden. Blaming others is so natural. It is awful, often difficult to see our own flaws. As in many areas, we are blinded by sin. This chapter introduces one of the foundational principles of scripture also taught in Deuteronomy and Kings. Um, can somebody maybe Adamo, if you are, can you open to Deuteronomy 24, 16? And Senna, can you open to 2 Kings 14.6? Let's quickly read them. Deuteronomy 24.16, 2 Kings. Deuteronomy 24.16. 20, Fathers shall not be put to death for their sons, nor shall sons be put to death for their fathers. Everyone shall be put to death for his own sin. Senna? Second Kings chapter 14, verse six. But the children of the murderers he slew not, according unto that which is written in the book of the law of Moses, wherein the Lord commanded, saying, the fathers shall not be put to death for his children, nor the children be put to death for the fathers. But every man shall be put to death for his own sin.
Okay. Now, um, having read that, it is clear that judgment is according to individual faith and conduct. He had foretold national punishment, but the reason was individual sin. Hence, righteousness is required individual by individual. But <clears throat> what we see in the beginning of chapter 18 is very interesting. Can someone just quickly read Ezekiel 18, 1 to 2? I can read it again. Yeah, go ahead. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, what do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel saying, the fathers eat the sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge. So here, we come face to face with the beginning of a totally new prophecy. It seemed some of the young men had been complaining that they had not sinned, and yet they were suffering for the sins of their fathers. Though they were themselves wicked and idolatrous, they blamed their forefathers for their state. The rationalizing is expressed in a current proverb. And remember when we were discussing last week, we talked about the fact that Ezekiel and Jeremiah almost existed about the same time. So there was this proverb, if we go to Jeremiah 31, 29, that this young men were holding on to as a reason to blame God or accuse God of punishing them for the sins of their fathers. Can somebody quickly run to run through Jeremiah 31, 29? Jeremiah 31, 29. In those days, they will not say again, the fathers have eaten saw grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. So this is where they are getting their, uh, you know, claim for. This evidently was a well-known proverb then in Israel. The point of this is that children suffer for their parents' sins. However, this proverb was not true in the case of Israel. And the Lord tells them that they may not use this proverb anymore. Which one is that? Evidently, the people thought they were suffering unjustly for their ancestors' sins. 25, 35. <laughs> Though there is an element of truth in the statement and that the children suffer as a consequence of their parents' sin, it could not be applied here. The proverb was being used as a lame excuse of their own sinful condition. Rather, the Lord says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father as we saw in verse 20. And Ezekiel thus preserves in proper balance the tragic consequences of sin and the principle of individual accountability. And as we go through the entire chapter, we can see how God put across his own defense and examples that he set to show that to each man, his own sin. And to each man will bear his own sin and will be punished for that. Now, with this background, I would like us to, you know, begin to discuss. I have some questions that I have set out here. And um, let us now begin to look at this and, um, you know, share with one another. I hope we'll be able to run through all the questions. Uh, on, a, on a very simple and um, note, um, let's say we know that Ezekiel is part of the Bible. Uh, it, it's known as one of the major prophets in the Bible. This should be simple. Can we state or mention all or some of the major or minor prophets in the Bible? But eventually, you know, as we're growing and we have kids of our own, 
and they come to us and ask us who are the major or minor prophets. Can we, you know, I don't expect all of us to know them or to answer all of them, but at least let's refresh our memories. Can anybody help us with, with that? I can start. I'll mention Jonah. So is Jonah a major or minor? Minor. Okay. Then? Isaiah and Jeremiah are major prophets. Yes. <clears throat> Let's get two more and then we'll move on. Daniel Hosea. Okay. Major minor. Yeah, major minor. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Um, I just wanted to know if you know we can mention some of them. And of course, there are a lot of them in the Bible. Permit me. So hello, brother. Okay, go ahead. Pastor Bondi was saying something, but his voice was oh, okay. very muffled. Oh, okay. Brother Bondi, if you're with us, can you please go ahead? I'm just um, uh, mentioning the uh, major prophets in Isaiah, Jeremiah, the city of Daniel. We still are having trouble um, getting you. Okay, maybe, maybe we'll come back to that. Let's move to the next question. Although I have talked about this in the introduction, I want someone to also, anybody, and this is open to all of us on the floor, to explain the metaphor of the grapes found in verse two. What did the eating the saw grapes and their teeth uh, were set on edge symbolize for me. They are not tricky questions. They are straightforward questions. Yes, ideally, let's let's even talk about it in terms of uh, like again going back home when you eat rice with stones. Basically, you chew on the stone and immediately you are miserable. You <laughs> you probably might not even want to finish eating the food. So imagine now, I chew it eating rice with stone and then my son or my daughter basically having the reaction that I'm supposed to get being the one, you know, um, chewing the stone. So similarly with the grape thing. Um, so if you eat saw grape, there's a reaction that you get, especially if your mouth hasn't eaten something for a while and you eat something saw, immediately you feel it, you know, um, from your expression, you would show it. But what this is saying is that in this case that somebody eats a saw grape, but instead of showing that reaction, immediately you see the reaction in their son or daughter. Um, so in, in bringing it basically to what um, the analogy is used for is the fact that a parent sins, but then God withholds judgment and instead punish the, the, the offspring of that parent. So um, a father basically commits murder, but instead of that father dying for his murder, um, the child instead is taken and killed, um, you know, in the place of his father. That is what the parable is talking about, or the proverb, sorry. Okay, thank you for that input. and. There's this, I don't know if this analogy really works for this, but um, there's this popular saying in, in Hausa, Ka Ka Albasa. 
that you borrowed my mouth to chew onions. You know, you are taking my own mouth to chew onions. So in the end, your mouth will be okay, free of the smell, but it is my own mouth that you borrowed to chew that, you know, will carry the order and all that. So I, I don't know if it applies here, but just like Adam rightly stated, you know, if you have gone through that um, chapter, you see this complaint by, and remember, you know, this these guys have been in captivity. So they feel like they are, and in a way, probably I'm answering the next question, they are in a state that they are in currently simply because, you know, um, of the sins of their fathers. And as we go through that chapter, we see God putting up a claim and a, a defense actually for that. And because they themselves were not sinless or free from sin. So our next question, which is closely related to that, but I'm still going to ask it all the same. Historically, what is happening? How could these people have the idea that they are being blamed for their father's sins? Like I said, I've already answered this. They were in captivity directly because of the sins of their fathers and grandfathers. What they didn't realize, however, is that they had plenty of sin of their own even at that time, because they were committing murder, there was adultery, they were idol worshiping and all that. Now to our next question. How does God, through Ezekiel, answer this idea that they are being punished for their parents' sins? Now we have to go back to um, you know, the, the, the reading. So anybody, please, is open to the floor. Um, from um, that term, um, verses three and four, there, the Lord is uh, making them to know that even though that yes, the father has eaten sour grape and then um, the children they are bearing the consequence. Sorry, brother Bondi, your I think we still have issue with your microphone can you hear me very well yes yes now oh. again oh i'm so sorry it's my earpiece okay they they here the lord uh, makes uh, makes them to know that um yes they've been shifting blames to their fathers that uh, they are suffering the consequences of the action uh, actions of their father. But the Lord is making them to know, like um, we have in verse 3, that as I live, said the Lord, ye shall not have any more occasion to use this proverb in Israel, that no more shall that be said. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of a father, so also the soul of a son. And most importantly, the soul that sin it each shadow. That is, every soul will bear the consequences of its action. And it's just reminding them, making them to know that why they even suffer more is not just because of what their father has done, is as well in relation to their own present sinning states. Okay, any more impute? Praise the Lord. Uh -huh. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah, hallelujah. Okay, um, yeah, I, I think um, the answer is quite apt uh, from what the last speaker said. 
And uh, personally, I, I think God deals with us um, on a personal note, right? Uh, God, God answered them, you know, by directly saying that it is the soul that sins that will die, right? So God is saying each and every one of us, you know, based on our soul, not just um, the relationship between the father and the, and the, and the son, but personally on a soul level, the soul that sins will die. The soul that is righteous will live, right? So I, I think um, that singular statement answers that question. Thank you for that in, input, Paula. Um, any other um, contributions? Okay, so before we go to our next question, today we had an interesting you know, discussion and it was about the LGBT issue and all that. Um, this, I did not prepare it actually in my note, but you know, there was um, some, some law that is supposed to be changed and the CT here, there was that, uh, um, you know, the, that group came out and the Christian group also came out and then there was some kind of, you know, um, clash between the two groups and all that. And, and uh, now, you know, there's this question that sometimes, I don't know if, if it's, all you know, us um, overdoing it maybe as Christians or, you know, yes, we should discourage these things. Yes, we, we should disapprove of all these things and all that. But um, like I was saying to, to um, some of my friends, I said, look, in the end, there are some people that have already decided that this is what they want to do. There's not much that you can do rather than to pray for them as a Christian. And we should always remember that it is a choice and God has given us all this choice and you cannot force them to say that they have to change and do that. You can pray for them. You can have one-on-one -on -one talk with them if the opportunity, you know, um, arises. But the truth is in the end, know that they are responsible for their own actions and God is going to judge them based on that. Now, coming back to, to our question, next question. The problem of blaming goes way, way back. I want someone to read Genesis chapter three, verse nine to 13. And as we read this, I want us to look at and pay attention to who the woman blames and who the man blames. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told thee that thou wast naked, as thou eaten of the tree which whereof I commanded thee thou shouldest not eat? The man said, The woman whom thou gavest me, gavest thou, thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? The woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So here again, we can see that the whole, you know, um, running away from responsibility started way, way long um, before now. And we can clearly see how, and technically, if you're reading at these verses, you can almost see that in the end, if you look at beyond who the woman and the man blamed, it's like, they are also blaming God. If, I mean, especially if you look at Adam's uh, response. The woman thou gave me, you know? So in a way, 
this has been that we have as human beings this tendency to shift blame to others and to shift responsibility to others and avoid it. There's also this Hausa saying that, um, um, what is it now? Leifi tudune se kahaonaka kahango nawani that um, Adamu, can you help me with that? In, uh, can can you probably put it better in English? Can, can you help me as I think? It's basically, that fault is a mountain. You climb on top of it and you see another person's own. Yeah, you climb on top of yours to see that of another person and blame, but you never take note of yours. And this is clearly what this chapter is about. You know, we trying to run away from our own responsibility. And that ties down to my next question. Why this tendency to avoid responsibility? Sorry, um, I have a question. Okay. So um, you pointed out that um, Adam blamed God mm. for the forgiving a wife who who made him basically to, to, to sin. Mm -hmm. But so really, if you think about it, God gave him the wife mm -hmm. and she caused him to sin. Mm -hmm. Isn't he right that to, to blame God? So op I open it to the floor. I guess a better question is, if if he if it is not okay for him to blame God, then why is he wrong? I have a response, but I want to hear what the floor will say. I think my response is Adam had a choice to make. You know, he wasn't, yeah, he was presented with the opportunity, but he had to make his own choice. So he made a choice to go with the what the woman told him to do. So that's what I think. Any other input? At the beginning of any contract, you have a set of rules that, that, um, that guard that contract. And Yes, you can blame God if the set of rules of that contract allow you to blame God. Sorry, I have to let somebody into the room. Okay. So, unfortunately for Adam and Eve, the contract they signed with God in Genesis chapter 2 means that they take responsibility for their actions. If in the beginning God had said, I would take res responsibility for your actions, then feel free to blame God. It's just like um, some of us, I was, we, there's this thing I used to say that, you know, somebody can tell you that, um, ah, marry this girl, she's fine. Ah, this girl is good for you. But if you marry the girl and there's problem, you can't go back and blame that person because the contract you signed was that you were making a choice to marry the girl, you were making a choice to marry the guy. So based on that contract, you can't blame the person that advised you or your, your father that told you to, you must marry this girl. So it's the same thing here. The contract got signed with them and God gave them free will to do whatever they wanted to do. And they accepted that contract. And yet they were, they, they, they fell short of that choice, that contract, like Senna said. Okay. Uh, yeah. any, in, any other in, okay. in addition, in addition to that, I will say the blame game here um, for Adam and Eve came along with the depraved nature. You know, when they sin, uh, uh, when they sin, the depraved nature, you know, came up with the blame game uh, as a as a defense you know, in that um, iniquity in which they had been found. So I would just say that the blame game came as a result of 
the depravity of their nature. Any other um, input? Um, okay. Um, I think, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to add uh, one other thing that, that came to my mind. Um, because of our human nature, I guess, uh, even after God has given us uh, the choice uh, to make, um, at every mistake, so at every um, issues that erupt, you, you see that our nature ordinarily tends towards uh, being defensive. Um, so that's where my mind went to. And uh, one of the things that kind of uh, came to my mind was that if Adam thought about it really well, um, you realize that God even made the woman out of Adam, out of his ribs. And he, I, Adam himself was the one that named her woman. So if he had thought about it truly well, he would have seen the fact that this was from me also, so I should take responsibility for what has happened. So that's what I just thought about also in, in line to um, thinking about why he blamed God for, for disobeying uh, God's uh, order. Thank you, Dio. Um, any other input? Well, actually, to all to add to all the brilliant responses, you know, a responsibility was handed over to to Adam, and he was there was free will one, and he was given a responsibility to take care of the garden, to take care of everything. God handed it over to him. But Adam, in a way, chose to do, you know, as he wished, because he had a choice to probably not to. I mean, he had a choice, not probably. He had a choice not to, but he still went ahead and did that. And it is true also in our day today, and as probably we go through some of those questions, we see that even in our lives today, we, just like Dios stated, we can be very defensive when it comes to things that are, we are supposed to own up to. And my other questions that were tied to that. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, um, it's maybe my question was not framed right, but mm -hmm. kind of everyone kind of hinted on it. Um, I think I or May, uh, Senna and I mentioned contract, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. really, what was the contract between Adam and Adam and God? God told him, gave him a commandment. Mm -hmm. Thou shall not eat from the tree from uh, in the center of the garden. Exactly. Basically, it's a commandment. So he has no right whatsoever to blame God. Mm -hmm. um, saying that God, uh, the wife that he, he, okay, regardless of the wife, God gave him a commandment and he, and he was supposed to. Yeah, so before the wife ever came along, there was a contract between the two of them. And now if he was going to listen to anyone who is the wiser, he's supposed to listen to God, not his wife. Mm -hmm. And I think it is important. I kind of just wanted us to kind of see that. You know, because this same issue, again, when you go to Exodus, when God was given the commandments, Exodus chapter five, um, from verse four, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or in or on the earth beneath or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquities of the fathers on the children on the um, on the third and fourth generation. I think this is what they are putting in context. They have forgotten the fact that God has given them a command that what yep. they should not be idol worship. And then he gave a series of commandments. And that's what the prophet was mentioning as basically God's defense to what is going on, that they themselves basically have broken something. And it's something that was established. It wasn't just their fathers that broke that commandment but even them are breaking it 
but they're thinking that, oh, God is just punishing us because our fathers did something. They're refusing to see. It's just the same thing that we saw with the people, again, in 34, the one that we kind of related to grace, right? Where they said, oh, Adam was just one man and God gave him the land. So we are more than, Ad well, sorry, not Adam. Abraham was just one man and we, God gave him the land. So we're more than Abraham because there are many of us. So we should own that land. However, there was a covenant with, with Abraham of obedience, you know? So the focus is always on the part where God demands obedience. Unfortunately, once we fail, we forget to see that need for obedience and then we begin to blame God. I kind of just wanted to draw attention to the part because obedience is always very important. All right, thank you for that wonderful input. And uh, well, I don't really expect an answer here, but we can try. Why didn't Adam and Eve just say, we blew it, we're sorry? Or why didn't the Jews in Ezekiel's day why did they have, why did they blame their parents? I want to, and I may be off here, but um, it, it, it occurred to me that Adam and Eve, the moment they ate from the tree of good of knowledge and evil, they became sinful. And the Bible says, you are of your father, the devil. And the moment you become sinful, the moment you open the gates to that, the nature and the behavior of Adam and Eve become that of their father, the devil. And it is the nature of God not to give excuses. It is the nature of a Christian. It is the nature of a transformed mind not to give excuses. But the moment they sinned, their hearts became untransformed. And... Now the choices they are making are no longer god godly choices. And if I compare it to our modern day age, you are living a righteous life, you're living a righteous life. The moment you sin against God, you go and you commit fornication or something like that, or you lie. The next thing is for you to cover it up with another sin because that has become the pattern you have imbibed. And so to, answer, you know, in a, to summarize um, the answer to your question is they could not, the reason they, they did not accept responsibility was they were already, they, they had sin had come into their heart. And typically the, when, when, sin, when sin conceives, it leads to death. It keeps going. It never stops. And I think Brodbinga has something to say. Yes, I, I agree that sin opens the door to more sins and their nature was changed. Their nature became depraved. But I still think even at that moment, they still had the free will. They could as well have confessed that they blew it. They were not robots. I know, I know the power of sin can cage one, can open more doors, but judging by the fact that some other people that had sinned also in the Bible, the way they easily go back to God, looking at David, looking at some other people, I, I just believe it was still another choice, another wrong choice they decided to make. Put another mm -hmm. person in that setting. Put another person in that setting, in that garden. After the first choice, it could still, it could still own up and acknowledge the sinful way. Thank you for your insight, uh, Brother Bing Binga. And in addition to that, I, I want to throw in another question. Oh, Senna, do you want to say something? Yes, I wanted to say something. <clears throat> and I think in the Bible, you see different reactions to when people fall into sin. 
I think it makes me remember when Cain then killed his brother. And the Lord came to him and said, where's your brother? And, you know, his reaction was, he comes from a place of pride. And I think sometimes when we fall into sin, like even as believers sometimes, it's pride that keeps us saying that wants to blame someone else, you know? You know, instead of humbly coming to God and seeing our faults and seeing where we fell short, you know, it's easy to be like, I think this one might even be relatable. Sometimes, you know, we might say we're in this situation, this very hard situation. We might say, what other choice did I have? Like, you know, this was there, this was there. And instead of coming to a place of like humility and just saying, God, forgive me, we might say, ah, it's the situation I found myself. So I think it's, I guess part of it is reminding us our reaction our attitude to sin. We shouldn't, we shouldn't come from a place of pride. We should come from a place of like, we, you know, we fell short. And yeah, so I just wanted to add that. Okay, um, thank you. And yes, um, all those points are true. And to add, add to pride, because I had pride, I think sometimes when we fall, we tend to act like we are wise and uh, you know we begin to look for other ways we think we're smart and we begin to look for other ways so in addition to that pride you know we want to act wise and say oh let's do it this other way and then in addition to that also excuses we come up with beautiful excuses you know, to, um, to, to, to run away from, from the fact that we have sinned. And I think this ties into my next question, which is, do you see this in modern life? Give an example where someone failed to take responsibility for his own sin. Do we see this in modern life today? Do we even see it in our own lives today? Do we have examples? Is anyone willing to share? I think I, I will go first. And, and um, I'm not saying this because my wife is, is listening, <laughs> but I think there are times and thanks to her, because I've come to understand some things, there are times when I do something wrong. I know it's wrong, but because I know I'm the man, you know, I'm the head of the house. Pride now sets me. <laughs> and I don't want to apologize. You know, I feel like ah, I'll be belittling myself now. How can I say sorry? You know, and what that does is it give, gives room for bitterness. It brings room where you disconnect and there's no communication, you know, and you don't talk like you're supposed to talk. So it is important. It may not probably, but, but that's the, 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 the scene of pride, you know, can actually take us sometimes to a point of no return. So we need to be very, very careful. And if anybody else wants to share, they are free. Otherwise we can just move to the next question or just to give a random example of what is happening around us in the world today, you're free to go ahead. No, um, mine is actually something that I did probably, I was just seven, six, seven, seven, eight years old. Um, I, I remember then, um, uh, what do you call it, soda, a bottle of soda in Nigeria was just seven, six kobo. And my mom sent me to buy soda um, from a neighbors that we have. Uh, just very close by and I bought the soda 
and they gave me four Kobo, but somehow I, I, I was very clumsy as a kid. I misplaced one, one Kobo. Now fear sets in, and I kind of just want to relate it to the case of Adam and Eve. That's one other thing that also sin brings us to, because it opens us up for what? For punishment. So you're afraid. You, you know, and vulnerable. so, yeah. So in my case, I, I was afraid of my mom because she will not understand because already they know that I was clumsy. So I was so playful. She knows that I probably was playing and, and threw the cobble away. So when I came home and they asked me, you know, is it not six kobo? And I told her, no, they have increased the price to several kobo. <laughs> now, one thing though, and it, this is amazing though, the things that God does for us sometimes, you know, that same evening, I remember clearly on the news when they were um, advertising, literally, I, I think it was uh, Mirinda and Pepsi, Pepsi company. That day they increased the price of minerals by one kobo to seven kobo. And I was sitting there, my mom was sitting there and she's like, oh, he's actually telling the truth. You know, now she doesn't, she doesn't know. I remember, but it is just a favor of God because I, in, in a sense, it wasn't like he stopped me from punishment or anything. But today I look back at it and see just like the case, the case what, when Abraham lied to, uh, what was his name? The uh, Abimelech saying Sarah was his wife, his you know, sister. God, uh, his sister, sorry. You know, and God basically works things out. There are some times that even in your mistakes, you know, God will still shower his, mis uh, his favor. But I think the point is the fact that, yes, we do these things when we're afraid. We go out of our way basically to cover up. Now, sometimes it's pride, which can act in the same way, or just so many other things just to, um, of the fallen, fallen nature. Uh, so that was, that's just what I wanted to share about my own situation. So may I ask, uh, it's, a, it's a question from all what Brother Yui has said. And, um, my wife and I were talking yesterday and we ended up in a situation where we were talking about situations where we felt divorce was ac accepted, acceptable. And we were painting pictures of, oh, perhaps if, uh, a woman was forced into a marriage and you know we we we, we give our, all our opinions now my question is that we know that there are no excuses for sin but are there situations that um may qualify or we may dispute the level the sinfulness of it let's say like the divorce situation i said or a man defending his household and murdering somebody and things like that. And there's, now this question might sound hypothetical, but in my experience here in the United States, I've seen people divorce us for all sorts of reasons. And some of it may sound legitimate. Some of it may not sound legitimate. Some of it is very heartbreaking. And you're like, hey, I, I think that is a legitimate reason. And so is there, are there situations where, um, I think you understand my question. Do, 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 okay, Sarah, go ahead. I was going to say, so I think the, what is the standard, right? And who determines the standard? I think for us as believers, God determines the standard. And even though there's some things that might seem a certain way we don't judge it based on the world standard based judge it based on god's standard right and just to give an example you know the story of joseph in the bible right mm -hmm. of a woman just coming after him with so much force right and at some point you know if we're being honest how many people we, we might give joseph cut him some slack like at some point like dude you, try, you did your best, right? But Joseph said, you know, how can I sin this great sin against God, right? So it wasn't about the world standard. It's about God's standard. You know, Daniel, you know, they say don't pray. 
And, you know, it's a difficult situation, right? It's even a situation where, I mean, you're going to die. If you make this choice, you could, but he decided otherwise because it's not man who stands the standard. It's God who stands the standard, it sets the standard. So you know, there might be times even in our walk where we are faced with such situations where it's not even, it's not like a temptation that we can easily get out of. Like it's a temptation that depends and so much is at stake, right? So even in those situations, you know, it's God who sets the standard and not man. So I think that's where we have to start from, you know, and so that's what I think. Any other? Brother Dyer. Oh, um, yeah. I I know it's only God that leads us. Um, that's why one of my strong prayers every morning that, um, you know, my doing in the morning, um, I mean, in the morning when I rise up and I just pray to God, I just say, God, lead me through the day. Because there are some things that we tell ourselves that is right, but seems if we follow the uh, God's word, we know um, it's sin. So this is an example. This happened way back in uh, when we were in school. Um, when uh, in, I mean, I lived in a hostel and college, um, and we we're four in room, and one of us was the pastor of the fellowship. So we had an incident where um, uh, we had uh, like cultists barge into our room middle of the night. We we're all sleeping, and one of them was looking for the pastor. And as God will have it, it was a pastor. They were asking the question. They woke him up, and they said, "Are you Ebenezer?" And what came out because he just was shocked and was woken so, uh, surprisingly. And he said, oh no, Ebenezer doesn't live here. And then they left. So it was one of our Bible study on a, uh, on a Friday in the fellowship discussing the thin line within where the Bible said, wisdom is profitable to direct. And in all that gets and get understanding. So we were saying, was that wisdom? Or was that just lie? So when things happen to us, a lot of times, I mean, as the Bible says, is to go down on our knees and just say, hey, Lord, I know I, I just sinned and just have mercy on me. But that, that's, the, that's how I see, how I reflect or how I respond to sin or temptation in my life. Like, I just take that selfless um, attitude to going to God and say, Lord, I can't, you know, I can't help it. Just help me or lead me. So when it happens or when something happens, I just know that, you know, if I need to go back to God and ask for forgiveness, I do. But if it happens in such a way that I think it's just God's wisdom, then I don't let it bother me, you know. So that's my input on that note. So I still have the question within that saying, was that with what happened to that person, do you see it as wisdom or do you see it as just lie at that at that at that moment? Because what he did saved saved his life, you know, he might have died for God's cause or Christ's cause, but you know, he, he, he got him unaware and the first thing that came out of his mouth was denial. So, so that's a, that's an experience that I, I mean always comes to my mind. Uh, okay, um, thank thank you for for those inputs. So, the floor again. Do we want to address these questions now? Is it something that we want to address later, or I I have one or two things that I want to chip in, but. Um, 
um, is open to the floor. They are very tough and thought-provoking questions, I believe. So let's let's see. Brother Benga. Maybe his intention was not to lie, or maybe the spirit of God just just moved him to say what he said. But but beyond that, um, in addition to what Brother Senna said, you know, sometimes we we buy the lie of the devil. The devil says the devil puts people in tight corners, like. Esau bought the lie of the devil and said, and he said, behold, I am at the point of death. And he, and he sold his birthright. And he just gave that excuse. So sometimes we might find ourselves in situations where, or people find themselves in situations where they just buy the lie of the devil that this is a tight corner, there is no other way out. I may just have to give an excuse and give in. And there's another passage of the Bible that I'm still trying to, to unravel. It's, it's in First Samuel chapter 16, verse two. Uh, permit me to read it. Samuel said, how can I go if Saul hear it? He will kill me. And the Lord said, take an ephah with, with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesus to the sacrifice and I will show thee what thou shalt do. I was wondering why God told Samuel to, to actually say that when exactly Samuel was going to anoint the next king of Israel. Okay. Well, um, Adam. So, um, really, I, with, when it comes to lying <laughs> and even the situation of... Um, now, I, I don't know if it, it's a lie or not, but I kind of just want to bring us to the case of Jesus. Let's read from um, John 18, beginning from verse 3. Judas, Judas then, having received the Roman cohorts and officers from the chief priest and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, Jesus the Nazarene. And he said to them, I am he. I am he. And Jesus also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. So when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. I think sometimes as humans, yes, we react. And this is what we are talking about. Fear, pride. Our desire is to defend and to protect ourselves. And like any other, they said a cornered animal will do even a harmless little sheep. When you corner it, it will charge against you to escape. So in our desire to escape, we will lie. But let's look at the example of Jesus here. He told them that what when he was asked, he, in fact, he knew beforehand what was coming to him. But he said, I am he. So either we, we, we trust in the God that we serve to save us through. Remember the, the three Hebrew kids too. They said what? We know our God can save us. But, you know, even if he doesn't, we will not bow to the king. So, and, and I think the idea, really, we have to go back and think deeply to what is death. Now, if we believe dying as a human being is the end of us, then we have missed the point. 
Because again, seeing the case of Christ and seeing the case of the, the three Hebrew children, they know that their God can save them. And today, even more so that we know that what? This death on earth is not the end of it. You know, that all of these things culminate to eternity. Basically, where you spend eternity is what is most important. And that is why Jesus keeps reminding us, let us not be afraid of death. Because basic, that is what the Satan uses to, to basically keep us in captivity. So I believe even in that moment, I don't know how I would have reacted, but I'm hoping that I will be able to, even in situations like that, to stand the truth. That even when someone is looking for me because of the name of God, that I will be able to stand. Because re really, when you think about it, that is what the early Christians faced with the Roman Empire. You know, that is what um, Paul the Apostle faced with the, with the Jews. You know, G in fact, Jesus said what? If people are searching for you in one city, run and go to the next city. He didn't say that they should lie. Now, if you're caught, you have to, he said what? Study and find yourself approved. Always be ready to defend your faith. And that is exactly what Stephen did. When they caught him and brought him before the Senate, he didn't, he didn't flinch. He stood there and he told them the word of God. You know, so remember our lives, just like Jesus's lives, is to bring salvation. That is what is the most important thing. I know it might sound difficult, but I, I believe that even in situations like that, we're supposed to stand for the truth because there is no lie that is little. There is no lie that is not. Remember, Jesus said what? All liars, all liars are the children of the devil. You know, the same thing with the case of divorce. The same thing with the case of the God. When the, uh, the, uh, the Pharisees accused, uh, uh, basically attacked Jesus, telling him that, look, Moses allowed divorce. And he told them that, no, it was because of the hardness of your heart. From the beginning, that was not the way it was. God meant for what? A man and a woman. And he said what? Except for the case of marital unfaithfulness. You see, our focus is not where Jesus is try, uh, pointing us to, which is what? From the beginning, Adam and Eve, God made man and woman. And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife. You know, and that, that is exactly what he's saying. But the problem is we focus on the fact that there is a possibility of divorce. And if we keep focusing on the possibility of divorce, if we keep focusing on the possibility of getting our lives saved, not Jesus saving us, then we will always fail. Hence the commandments, do not. It is a sharp contrast between do and do not. You know, don't do this. You know, so until we focus, the, the, the reason why today we are creeping into sin is again, because we have started blurring the lines, you know, that it is okay, you know, it is okay, oh, because of this. Okay, look at what divorce has brought into the church. Basically, we're raising children that don't know anything because all the parents are trying to do is to get the favor of their children. So they don't train them the way they should go. You know, all these things that we're doing, having today, we're talking about LGBT. Again, it's not, be, it's because the foundation of the house, the foundation of government has been destroyed by Satan. It was intentional. So the idea is we have to study and find ourselves uh, approved and stop being afraid. We have to allow the word of God to expel fear from us. Because all these things that we're saying, again, if assuming we last week we talked about going out and preaching the gospel, it, it is a hostile world out there. So are we saying that every time we go and they catch us in gospel, we're going to lie to save ourselves? You know, let's think about that. Okay, any further um, imputes? Can I add one more? thing to say okay go ahead i think when it comes to doing god's will i think we have to always think of the long game right 
there is a story of what's his name? Peter. Peter was asked to deny Jesus, you know, and they asked him, do you know this man? And, you know, even though Peter got out of that situation, you know, but Peter wept like he was heartbroken, right? And I think I've, I'm, I love the story of Peter because this same Peter, if you keep reading the Bible, he stood for the gospel, right? He didn't deny the gospel. So I think the when we think of doing God's will or faced with temptations, I think we always need to play the long game. A man, you know, if you think of Joseph, if Joseph had played the short game just to get out of trouble, right? The story that we read in the Bible, right? Would not be there, right? If people like Daniel had played the short game of getting out of a situation. So I think you know, there's that verse in Psalm it says, trust the Lord, trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will bring it to pass I think in our own understanding it is safe to just say okay act in the flesh and say oh man or say what we want to say to get out of the situation but it's, it also shows that who we trust right do we trust in God to see us through that situation do we trust in God that God is in control that no matter what happens and I think there's a, you no, know, I know there's a verse where Jesus was telling people who to fear. He said, don't fear man that can kill the flesh and nothing else. But fear God who can kill the flesh and afterwards send to hell. So I think in, in such situations, we need to be, we need to look up. Right? It's hard, right? But we need to look up and let God have his way. I remember there's an example, and this is not even the same. Someone asked me at work one time, and it was just a small talk. It was just like, Senna, what kind of music do you listen to? And it was so simple of a conversation that I mainly listen to like Christian music, right? But I told this person, I'm like, oh, I listen to anything, you know, you know, like whatever sounds good. Even though it's it's not completely false, but what do the right answer is I listen to Christian music. And there was a part of me that I didn't want to go that route. I'm just like, oh, let's not start something like that. And afterward, in my mind, I'm like, that's an opportunity that was lost, right? You know, you're afraid. There's, I guess, let's call it fear, right? Maybe you're afraid of what this person would think about you. If you said, I listen to Christian music. And I think there, that God gives us opportunities every once in a while. And our daily life to stand on his word, right? It's it's one thing to claim all these things we believe in the Bible and say, God does this, God does this, and God does that. But every once in a while, we have this opportunity to stand and show the world who, you know, in a very practical situation where, you know, you know, you should backdate that document, you know, and you have to just be like, I can't, you know, I'm a Christian, right? And, you know, and I so just to cut the rambling short, right, is to, we need to trust, it. and we may not always get it right, but it's not something that we should not want to get it right. Like, I learn, I like Peter a lot, because this is a man who denied Christ one time, and this is a man that then told the Pharisees that, you tell me if, which is right, to obey man or to obey God. And it's not trying to downplay some situations we might find ourselves. Those are hard situations to be in sometimes. But I think at the end of it all, Christ should be glorified. We should look to the cross. We should look to Christ beyond the fear of men. Okay. Um, thank you guys for all that. I have some thoughts about that, but I believe that um, this question has been uh, I mean, a lot of it has been answered. Justice has been done to it. I um, would like us to move on. I won't um, probably when this pops up again, we will share more and discuss on it. But let's go back to the text in time. But the bottom line is, like Senna said, like Adam said, who do we look up to? The world standard? or God's standard. 
what forms us. Our emotions, what others say, or is it the Bible? And for us as believers, we have been warned and we have been called to make Bible our reference point. And it's true, we may not always get it right. But when we do get it wrong, never be comfortable in that zone. Think it right with God, always. So let's move to the next question. Um, and I think this has been answered. I probably will have to rush some few because I'm looking at the time. I still have like, what, maybe six, seven questions to go. I think this has been answered, um, but I'll just read the question in case you want to write it down. Um, has there ever been a time maybe way, way back in time when you blamed others for what you were responsible for? And I think Adamu shared a little of, you know, that and the advert came to his rescue. Um, so, you know, um, we, we should reflect on this as individuals and, and, and think about it. Then one question, what are the advantages for you taking responsibility for your own life? What is in it for you to admit that you sinned, you blew it? and you need forgiveness. What are some of the advantages? We can mention two or three and then go on to the next question. We have peace with God. Excellent. You, you, will, you will shut the mouth of the accuser the accuser will have nothing to hold on to and it will not open the doors to more sins. Thank you very much. Any other one? Maybe one last one before we move. Okay, next question. Can you say the question one more time? Okay, so, you know, what are the advantages, you know, we, we tend to gain for taking responsibility for our own life? What is it in for you to admit that you have sinned and blew it and that you need forgiveness? Oh, okay. In, in context with, the, with the, what we're studying, then that's what you're asking. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. It makes sense now. I was just confused. No, okay. So um, if this advantages are good and we know they are, why do we find it difficult? And why don't we do it? I think this also has been answered, right? We talked about pride. We try to be wise and smart about it, right? So let's, let's move to the next one. Can God forgive sin we won't admit and take responsibility for? I don't know if it's that he can't, but he definitely won't. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you for that straightforward answer. Okay, any any impute apart from that? He, he has already forgiven our sins. He has, he has nailed them on the cross. Colossians says that he has trampled over the devil, but our, us admitting it is for our own good. And it's for us to be at peace with him. So, but he has already done his part. And we, just like Adam and Eve, just story of Adam and Eve, he actually came down to them and asked them, where are you? Why are you hiding? Even then he was merciful. But well, we humans live in fear and pride. Okay. Thank you Sorry. very much. Sorry. Okay. I want to inquire to please very proud of that. I do understand that Christ has died. He has forgiven our sins. But does that in any way equate that? Uh, because he said he just wants us to come to him or something. If we don't come to him for forgiveness, 
those to work as a job. So that's automatically have a very quite well, you were breaking up a little, sir, but I think I got the meat of your question. So, um, so my response was just that the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, chapter four, that that we should all we need to do is enter into His rest. If we do not enter into His rest, we are in danger of eternal perdition. But His rest is there. Is, um, when I mean that he has already forgiven, I don't mean that he's going to su supersede our will. No, he has already made, he has already done the sacrifice and then he, there is no more sacrifice to be made by him. All we have to do is, Bible says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. So his forgiveness is already firm in his word. I am faithful and just, I will forgive you. Just like the father for the prodigal son, he's standing at the window waiting for us to run to him. So he has done his part. But if we do not run to him, if we do not come to him, the Bible says the soul shall, the soul that sinned shall die. I don't know if that, if that helps them. Breaking your, your microphone is breaking up. Your so. microphone is breaking. Hello? Yes, sir. It's still it's still oh, breaking up. It's still breaking. Hello. Yes, I think it sounds yeah. better. Okay. No, I said that I appreciate your answer. I just wanted a clarification. Otherwise, there could have been a misconception based on the way you navigated the answer. Okay. Thank you very, well, very much. You understand. For yeah. Uh, thank you for for um, pinpointing that out. And okay, so let's move to the next one. And this is an interesting question. Is there such a thing as taking too much responsibility? Do you ever know or have you ever known anyone who is willing to take all the blame, not only for his own sin? but also for the sin of everyone around them. Is this good or bad? Sorry, it's a compound question. There are lots of, but I don't know if we should take them one after the other or, you know. If I may start the answer and while others are thinking, I, I don't think there is such a thing as taking too much responsibility. Now, I say that carefully. The reason I say there is not such a thing as taking too much responsibility is if you understand the gravity of sin, if you understand the extent to which sin can destroy, you will, <laughs> you will take as much responsibility as possible. And because sin just keeps going and going and going, and we see people like Daniel and Nehemiah, they pray that we have sinned, and we tend to give them credit that, oh, they took on the sin of, um, of Israel. And be that as it may, they understood that they as people of God had a responsibility that the reason why sin festers is because we people of God, sometimes we do not do our job. We do not do our job in righteousness and God has it. And it's very important for us to have a revelation. Last week, I remember we learned about um, Isaiah. And Isaiah, Brodinger pointed out in Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah was saying, woe unto ch children of Israel, woe unto the children of Israel. Chapter 1, woe unto them, come now. Chapter 3, woe unto the daughters of Zion. But Isaiah finally understood in chapter 6 the depravity of himself. When he saw the holiness of God, he saw how horrible he was. But in using human eyes, it's impossible to see that. But when you have a glimpse into the holiness of God, you start saying things like, oh, that I'm a worm and woe unto me. And those are people that have a glimpse into the holiness of God. So if we, by any chance, have a chance to see how holy and powerful and godly our, our Father in heaven is, I don't think we would ever claim that we are taking too much responsibility. 
Okay, any other input? Okay, maybe to further address I, that. Okay, go ahead. I think the only part where we'll be taking too much responsibility is when we take all the responsibility and refuse to let the people also that are wrong with us, that they are wrong with us so that they take responsibility for themselves also. Because sometimes we tend to do that, especially when it comes to family. You know, we want to continue to just pray, but not correcting a family member that is going wrong. You know, because we're not helping that family member at all. You know, uh, again, going back to Lot, Lot and his two daughters made it out of Sodom and Gomorrah. But the Bible only speaks of Lot as being the righteous man that was tormented when he was in, um, in, uh, when he was in Sodom and Gomorrah. So I think it is important that, though, yes, we have the responsibility to take responsibility of sins that are even not ours, um, however, we should also take responsibility of letting other people that have sinned together with us um, to do what is right also. Yes, so um, um, that goes in line with what I actually had in mind. Yes, it is noble. Yes, it is a humble thing to do that you take the responsibility of others. But sometimes uh, we need to be careful so that Doing that does not expose us to controlling another person and letting them know that they are also responsible for their own actions. Because in the end, you know, the soul that sings dies. So let them also be aware that, hey, you blew it. Let's correct in love, even as we own up to. Because sometimes you may argue, again, with, with your wife. Sometimes you are right and she's wrong. For the sake of peace, you apologize, right? But it's also important that probably when all the sparks die out and everybody don't cool down, you, you know, Talk about this so that people know, you know, their, their responsibility and they will be able to take corrections and, you know, become better. Um, I still have some questions, but I'm, I kind of, I'm looking at the time. Do we have the energy and stamina to finish? I think I have four more or do we just end it? I think we can um, go um, for seven more minutes. Let's let's go till five o'clock and then I'll write around up. Okay, then quickly then. Um okay. Um looking again to Ezekiel chapter 18, let's look at 23 and 32. What do we learn about God from these verses? 1823. And um, then 32, what do we learn from these verses? I'll read, have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, not that he should return from his ways and live? Verse 32, for I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. So? What do we learn from this? It's simple and straightforward. That God has no pleasure in the death of anyone. Yep. It is his will that we all come to repentance and to come to his saving grace. Um, whose sins are you responsible for? yours yep largely yours from what we have read today what happens to sin that are repented of uh, 
God forgives it and it's forgotten. Yep, it is forgotten. And one quick thing though, right? So there are verses in the Bible that, that warns us that we shouldn't cause someone else to sin, right? And though, you know, it's, it seems like there is a, no, that verse that said, if any one of you cause one of these little ones to stumble, it's better for um, the millstone to be hung over their neck or something like that. So I think in God's parameters for severity of sin, you know, he also warns us not to cause other people to stumble, other people to come to one. Okay, thank you. Now I would like to quickly draw us to Hebrew chapter 6, verse 4 to 6. And maybe I'll just read it because I have it typed here. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tested of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tested the good news, the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and, are, and put him to an open shame. Now, who can help elaborate this scripture? It's kind of related to Ezekiel 18.24. I or you can read Ezekiel 18.24. For when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, who committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live. All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned in his trespass, that he has trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. So, the question I have here is, is this speaking of a person falling and committing, you know, just one sin and, and not repenting? There is a two, one word that you can see in the, in the two scriptures at least in the King James Version, um, verse 24, it says, in the Hebrews verse that you read, I don't know what verse it was, I, I stepped out for a quick second. It says okay. that they fall away. Mm -hmm. And in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 24, it says that righteous turneth away. Mm -hmm. And so the similarities between these two scriptures is a deliberate apostasy from God a deliberate move away from God. And the Bible describes it as apostasy. The Bible describes it as a situation. And we're talking about a righteous person, somebody who loves the Lord, somebody who has the knowledge of holiness and the knowledge of the righteous God. So that turning away shows a deliberate move away from God. We see someone like Peter. Peter stumbled, and immediately he stumbled, he repented. David stumbled. And immediately he stumbled, he repented. When Nathan came to him and he fell on his knees, these people did not turn away. But then we see people like Saul, who became adamant and, and uh, deliberately anti-God. And in that case, the Bible says that all this righteousness shall be not be mentioned, and in this sin he shall die. So that, that is a key part. As long as we repent, and repent does not mean rising and falling, rising and falling. Repent means when you sin, you turn from that sin, and you stay righteous. As long as we repent, 
we are going to be, we have the favor and the protection and the, the love of God upon us. Thank you so much. Excellent, Ayo. And uh, so just to add, this is a person who began living for God, but then changed his lifestyle back to sinful ways and decides to remain there. And we find in the following scripture in um, Second Peter, maybe you just take that down. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 21. The gravity or how bad this action is. And I will read Second Peter 2.21. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. We as Christians need to be careful. Now, two things before we conclude. I want us to bow our heads and pray quickly. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Show me any way of my life in which I am blaming others and failing to take responsibility for my own life. Right now, I repent of my failure to take responsibility for my life. And I just now take responsibility again. Forgive me where I have sinned. Cleanse me and empower me to do what I should. Thank you for taking pleasure in my repentance. I believe, and amen, I believe that it is important for us to have this reflection because one way or the other, we have erred. And my final question, probably a takeaway, take home question, what has Ezekiel done in this chapter? Anybody can contribute in maybe a sentence. Mrs. AK says he set the record straight. Yes. Any other input? God created us for eternal life. We are his creation. We can be his sons. Ezekiel has preached a beautiful message of repentance and salvation. Each person must decide for himself. We must choose. We can have life or death, but not both. The choice is ours. Thank you all for listening. And may the Lord help us to uphold his word regardless of whatever we, situation we may find ourselves in. Amen. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Brother Aurelfe as he rounds up and leads us in prayer. I'd like us to close our eyes and bow our heads. This is really a time for sober reflection. Search me. O oh God, I know my heart today. Try me, O oh God, and know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked within me. Search me, you go. 
Lord, and set me free. I want you to open your mouth and just talk to go. A lot have been discussed today. Dr. Adamo has said a lot. The sinner has said a lot. Um, he has taught us today, where do you stand? Is there a reason for us to fall? Is there a reason for us to compromise? Is there a reason for us to take responsibility? Why do you argue with your husband? You argue with your wife? You aren't taking responsibility. You aren't looking at the scripture. You aren't correcting your children. At the end of the family. As the mother in the family, you answer of the world, feminism. How many of us are following the way of the world as ultra? Father, we are first. Uh, microphone is going in and out. I don't know if you can hear me. As Christians, we must obey the Bible no matter the intention of God. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Our loving Father, we thank you. This morning, this night, and the truth will be. Give you the glory for this word of God we have heard today. How I ask and pray that your mercy will flow today and you forgive all of us, wherever we have heard, as husbands, as wives, as princes and single bachelors, as fathers and mothers. Wherever we have heard, let the fountain of mercy be open to us and let us flow and may all may we all be forgiven in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have no reason to fill you. Mercy is available. Grace is available. We have no reason to, to fall. I we ask and pray. Give us grace to hold on constantly to the own of the altar in Jesus' name. So I'm asking and praying. Give us the grace to spend time with you. To look always at Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We fall, we fall into fear, we fall not to project you to the world because we are afraid of the world, because we're not looking up to you, because we're not praying, because we're not looking into the perfect law of liberty, the word of God. And we are asking and praying today, change us. Let your spirit impact upon our soul. Let our mind be renewed in your word, in your blood, in your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us, Lord, that none of us will found one thing. We found guilty of this word we have had today. Not the preacher, not any of us. Lord, help us, God. We ask and pray that you will help us. Hold our hands, Lord, until we see you face to face in heaven in Jesus' name. Every opportunity you present before us to share the word of God, to shine the light, to testify of Jesus, help us not to misuse them in Jesus' name. Please hold our hands and guide us on, O oh God. This new week, I ask and pray anyone facing any particular challenge in their health, in their place of work, in their finances, Lord, in their neighborhood, I ask that your mercy will flow, your grace will flow, your supernatural power will work in every life, every situation, in Jesus' name. 
anyone having sickness in their body, let your healing flow. Let them experience divine healing in Jesus' name. Anyone experiencing struggle, I pray that the power from heaven we visit them and all their struggle, all their pains, all their aches will go away in Jesus' name. Give us grace to walk with you. Give us grace to pray. Give us grace to read your word. Give us grace to have a made up mind to serve you. Thank you, Jesus, because you have answered in Jesus Christ's name. I have prayed. Amen. 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 Amen and amen. I want to thank God for this very rich study today. I'm very glad. The last two weeks we've had a study on Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel. And honestly, we are very grateful to God because he tells us the things that are on his heart. I pray that God will help us to take personal responsibility in Jesus' name. I want to say that it's, it's, we should not leave without acknowledging that we, had, we have a visitor here. I don't know who the person is. And it might just be that the person has a name that I don't recognize. It says Sophia Gami. I like to say Gamma. I don't know, Sister Sophia, greetings. That's oh, my wife. That's your wife. Aha. Uh -huh. okay. Now okay. that I introduce herself anyways. <laughs> okay. I know that her name is Sophia, but I didn't connect it that she was the one. I'm sorry. She's Sophia the first. The first, yes. Sister Sophia, yes. greetings, man. Greetings. Nice to finally meet everyone. Yes, we're glad that you're logged into our meeting today on your own laptop. Yes. That's good. Yes, I, I, well, I was around for most of it. I listened to most of it in between um, also tending to my toddler. So, yes. so I got most of it. And, uh, so that was, was really very nice and I, I, I enjoyed it. Most of the time I'm not able to join because of her. Mom, I think you can even hear her. We can hear her. <laughs> yes, so it's usually because of her, and then Aria. usually we go to church, Mommy. and then we all get Aria. So well, <laughs> she has yes, Aria. <laughs> okay, 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 I'm coming. Yeah, so this, you can see she has, she has already yeah. given me, she has expressly <laughs> stated the reason why I'm not usually around for the, for the fellowship. Sister Sophia, thank you. You know, some yeah. reason they think that they are in charge. But yeah, they are in charge. They don't think. <laughs> no, I am. I am leading a movement to take back our land. Yeah, take back the land. power. Yes. Yeah, okay. At, at this overcome. age, they yeah, are the toddlers. They are in charge. <laughs> but as they grow, of course, we need to to correct that. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And they, yes, uh, it is good you. to have Aria too. She's she's one of us, and so and, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for joining us today. Greetings to everybody, and I want to say today we had uh, I think we had eighteen people. Yes, very excited about that, and I hope that we all can show up again and again to encourage us. Next week we're going to have Pastor Bondi teaching us, and then the week after that we have. Pastor Binga teaching us. And then the week after that, I haven't told them yet, but at least Pastor Binga and Brother, and brother, and brother Tuesday will be the one the week after that. So um, so just a plan ahead for all of that. And if there's anything that we can pray for you for, please let us know. There are prayerful people in this group. If you have any prayer requests, if there's challenges you're facing, please let us know and we'll pray. And uh, for those that we could not greet, I want to say thank you for all of you for coming. And uh, for Brother Fola, for the uh, new you for the teaching that we had today. And I wish you all a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you to those who are in Nigeria who have stayed till 12.15 a.m. 
are very grateful and the Lord will bless and reward you. And one of these days, one of these days in the near future, we'll all gather here somewhere in some beautiful cabin to have fellowship, eating extremely, extremely beautiful food and fellowshipping in person. Online is nice, but it would be nice for us to all meet in person. And we have rich people on this platform that can make it happen. And I love what happens that. today. But I just you want to make it happen, sir? I said, I look forward to that. Oh, you look forward to that. Okay, okay. Because I thought for that, just was saying that I'll make it happen anyway. I look forward to it too. So thank you all so much. And Brother Yo, you thank you for the teaching. Here is where I, I, I give my official greeting. Goodbye, Nigeria. Goodbye, Canada. Goodbye, Kansas. Goodbye, Tennessee. Goodbye, Illinois. And goodbye, Boise. Goodbye, Badagri and Nigeria. Thank you.